This message is brought to you by the rebrand of Throttle Graphics and Designs. This publication may not be reposted without the authorized written consent of Throttle Graphics and Designs. NASCAR Camping World Ford F-150 NASCAR Xfinity Ford Mustang NASCAR Cup Series Next Gen Ford Mustang Arca Menards This has been the publication of the redesign and rebranding of Throttle Graphics and Designs. This message may not be reposted, republicated, or rebroadcasted without the authorized written consent of Throttle Graphics and Designs. Thank you, and thanks for your time. Hudson Auto Works is conveniently located off of Highway 29, 812 Post Street, Greensboro, North Carolina. Our beautiful 15,000 square feet facility is home to 21 highly trained professionals offering used car sales, collision repair, automotive detailing, and the best customer service you won't find anywhere else. Visit us at www.hudsonautoworks.com or call us at 336-772-0685. at East Coast Wings and Grill. Enjoy 75 tasty flavors of buffalo wings, fresh salads, burgers, and a variety of delicious dishes. Experience a family-friendly atmosphere you can't get anywhere else. Fresh, family, fun. Get your business noticed with quality vinyl vehicle wraps from Ruth Sign Service. Ruth Sign Service has been providing truck lettering and quality printed vehicle graphics for over 50 years. Now they offer premium digital printing wraps for all types of vehicles. Add a new element of energy to your company's image. Get more mileage out of your business to business advertising by wrapping your vehicle into a moving billboard from Ruth Sign Service. Ruth Sign Service in Greensboro where you can get wrapped and get noticed. Racing isn't easy. But experiencing it is. iRacing puts you in the driver's seat with the industry's leading sim racing game. Drive on laser scan replicas of the greatest racing circuits from around the world. Go head to head against other drivers chosen by skill based matchmaking to ensure competitive racing at every level. Compete across all your favorite series. In officially licensed cars, engineered to deliver the most accurate driving experience possible. Join a race or host your own with players from across the globe. Race against the computer or in a league with friends. Feel the thrill behind the wheel. Visit iRacing.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to FTN's coverage for split number two of the eNASCAR qualifying iRacing series here from No Limits, Texas, down to the Fort Worth area, obviously heart of Texas, getting ready for some mile and a half action here today. Should be a fun one. Last year, we saw an awesome race that we're going to talk about here in just a second. And I'm Jason Rockfell, joined alongside driver in the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series for Joe Gibbs Racing, Daniel Falkingham, and our producer, and also our buddy, Kenneth Bueno as well, guys. Good evening, guys. I mean, listen, round one's almost over already. We only got tonight and then three races left here, Kenneth. It, it's going to be a really interesting one. I feel like these guys, if you don't have your mindset uh, in the right area here at this portion of round one. I mean, you're in big trouble here coming into tonight. 
you could be in big trouble. But Jason, as we move past halfway here in round one, you could also argue the case that there is still a little time to turn things around. There are drivers who drop weeks. There are drivers who maybe were bouncing off a couple average finishes, but now can knock it out of the park with the last several races, including tonight at Texas, which should be a up-in-the-air type race. It's a mile and a half, and we've seen mile and a half before in round one, but this one very different like the others. Yeah, and it definitely is a completely different, you know, scenario. And last year, Dan, obviously, this is right where you started. Uh, Your broadcasting, I guess you could so, you know, call it your so-called side career. I don't really know, but I mean, uh, me, you, Terry Radford, Charles Wooten, uh, over there with the collaboration for FTN and LSR TV. You called your very first race here, man, uh, and it was an awesome one. We saw Anthony Burroughs obviously uh, take the win just one year ago over Logan Helton and Max Brady. Uh, in split number two, man, it was an awesome race. What kind of racing do you think we're going to be expecting here tonight? Yeah, I remember that vivid. I vividly remember that pass Anthony Burroughs made on a late restart to take that win away. It was a great finish, great race last year. But yeah, going into tonight, it's going to be a lot of the same stuff for a lot of these guys. And just to think, you guys mentioned it, we're already halfway through the first round of the qualifying series. It's just time's flying by really quick. And the time is really running out for a lot of these guys, too that are low on the points, and they need to get some points now if they're especially right around that cut line because uh, I know a thing or two about being around the cut line a lot in my uh, road to pro slash pro career. So uh, definitely a start with being the second half of the season. It's really crunch time for a lot of these guys now, and certainly at Texas where there are going to be a lot of wide open throttle, a lot of maybe pack racing we might be able to see. Uh, it's definitely it's crunch time for a lot of these guys now. Yeah, and you see the upcoming remaining schedule for round number one. After this, in two weeks' time, we'll head to my favorite track, probably one of my home tracks, Dover Motor Speedway. In two weeks' time, then on May 9th, we'll head to Darlington. And then May 23rd, right before Memorial Day weekend, obviously, we will close it out for round number one at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. And then you see right next to it is week one through seven for round number two. Uh, of the eNASCAR qualifying iRacing series here. And let's just take a look real quick if we have the graphic uh, with the ladder, per se, here for uh, the eNASCAR qualifying iRacing series. And, Dan, take us through that because, obviously, you know, week in and week out, it just seems like there's always something more to talk about. And, obviously, it's a really big deal uh, getting through this series and then, obviously, the contender and if you want to make it to the Coke series. Yep, just like I mentioned, we got two rounds in this opening of the qualifying series. In this like, opening round of the qualifying series, you got to get through the top 70 to make it to round two of the qualifying series. And then from there, the top 20 will be going through to the contender series. And then from there, the top 30 will be eligible. They're not officially locked in, but they'll be eligible for the free agency draft at the start of the 2025 season. So you may do all the work all the way through contender to get into the Coke series, but the job ain't done there yet because you have to go through that free agency pool to hopefully get picked for the Coke series. But for now, that is a long ways away. We'll discuss that more when the time comes around. But that's pretty simple. For right now, for all these guys, top 70 is the main goal. Yeah, and top 70 is definitely the main goal. And obviously, Kenneth, you guys saw an awesome race last or a couple weeks ago. Uh, at Richmond, kind of caution filled. Uh, but I mean, what was that like for these drivers? You know, you got to try to bounce back from what you had two weeks ago. It was a short track, a lot of beaten, banging, a lot of torn up race trucks at the end of that. I mean, what more are these drivers going to need to do here tonight if they want to try to advance? Well, the biggest thing is just surviving, Jason. And for a lot of the drivers who have been in caught up in bad luck or big crashes, especially at Richmond, where we did see a lot of torn up race trucks and a lot of three, four wide action that resulted in incidents. This one is just all about surviving, making sure you can get back on that stable foot before you can start to sprint all the way to the end of round one but one thing that we also saw Jason that really took us for a wild ride was Brandon Hawk coming from top split his first race and second split leading every single lap of that race all 150 of them to get the checkered flag a picture perfect race that did spoil a lot of other drivers opportunities at getting a win in the Commonwealth of Virginia so that spoiler played a factor into it we don't expect to see Brandon Hawk in this session, we expect a bulk of those who have been in split to the entire season to be here this time around at Texas. So that will be another thing you have to juggle with as a driver. You get basically one race eliminated from you in terms of the checkered flag. You're going to have to gun for those last checkered flags that are available, including tonight. 
Yeah, and obviously, and Dan, we just saw Brandon Hawk obviously take home that victory at Richmond a couple weeks ago. And before we head to on-track activity, I just want to ask you, you know, as a driver, I mean, how good does it feel knowing that you can go out there and lead 150 laps, flag to flag pretty much, uh, the entire way around? I know that's a great feeling, but as a driver, what kind of mentality do you have after something like that happens? Yeah, I mean, for Brandon Hawk, uh, two weeks ago at Richmond, it always feels good when you can get up front and just be able to just lead every single lap and just have that perfect of a race. It's pretty rare you can see that these days in the E-NASCAR ladder. Uh, it's unfortunate that I haven't had one of those days yet, um, I should say, but, uh, but yeah, it always feels good, especially for Brandon Hawk, who made the jump from the third split up to the second split, and he is in our race tonight as well, so he's looking to maybe go back-to-back for that second split, and hopefully uh, he's, hopefully he has the same sort of luck, but it may be a little different because we were at Richmond at a short track, and now we're back to the mile and a half, back to the cookie cutters, where it may be a little bit more challenging for him considering uh, the kind of race we're going to be in for tonight. Yeah, and we're going to head that on-track activity here in just a second. Obviously, Brandon Hawk took home the victory a couple weeks ago at Richmond over Joseph Galata, Daniel Nanny, Tyler Lateral, in fourth, Johnny Avila rounded out the top five with Brandon Hawkins in sixth, Cade McClendley seventh, River Hayes, Zach Campbell, and Kevin Champagne uh, were your top ten. And tonight, going to be 100 laps, 150 miles, uh, 50 laps, Dan, looks to be about the fuel run. I mean, talk about it. You know, these guys are going to have to pretty much split this race in half from what we've seen, what we've talked about. It was like that last year, but obviously one caution could flip this race completely upside down. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of these guys should be able to stretch the fuel, but if you're up front leading laps, you'll be burning a lot more fuel than everyone else. So I, it's going to be close for a lot of these guys, but it should be right around that 50 laps. Uh, right around, should be able to split it right in half. So I expect everyone to see everyone. If we go green, no cautions, everyone pit right around at the same exact time. Or a lot of guys might be able to save a lot of fuel and be able to go longer than mostly everyone else. So... We'll just have to wait and see, but you never know with these second split races. They've been, they've, we've had a lot of green flag racing. A lot of them have been caution filled, but uh, it's going to be no different seeing what kind of race we're going to have tonight as qualifying is complete and we're headed to the starting grid. And here we go, getting ready to give you your lineup for tonight's race here at Texas. 150 miles, 100 laps here as they get ready to grid. So let's go over it here. Top 10, row number one, Patrick Gitter. There alongside Agnel Phillip had a great run a couple weeks ago at Richmond. We're going to see what he can do tonight. Row number two, Carson Bowers and the young gun, Jack Mace. They're in the number seven machine. Row number three, you'll find Nate Stewart in the 27 and Dylan Pettis in the 14 machine. Row number four, you'll find Ryan Andrew and Daniel Nanny, who's looking to have a great run here tonight as well. And then rounding out the top 10, Dan, you'll find Dalton Millam and also Will Cooley in the 22 machine. On the row number six, we got Adam Garza and Connor Euroshack. Euroshack winner a couple weeks back earlier in the season, hoping he had the same success tonight. Uh, hail to Akbuze starting in P13, and then Brandon Hawk, like we mentioned last two weeks ago, won at Richmond. He's back here tonight starting in P14. And then we got Justin Bolton and uh, Johan Seminario that are going to be rounding out row eight, Johnny Avila and Matthew Boniface, Rounding out row number nine. And then we got Dominic Lukomsky and Kevin Champagne completing the top 20 there, uh, Kenneth. Back to 21st inside row 11, you'll find the Nexus Esports driver of Jacob Potak with the 2023 Firecracker 400 winner in Logan Helton. I believe the first time we see him in second split action. River Hayes in the 30 will start inside from row 12. He'll be joined alongside by the Canadian and one driver in this split. Highest I rating, Brandon Hawken for Nexus Esports, rolling deep in this field from 24th. Jimmy Norman going to be inside the top 25 with Travis Manning on his outside. That's back to row 13 before you'll find the two doubled up in row 14. Cabe McClenney in the four and Anthony Permota in the number 34 machine. Derek Heitman performed well at Daytona. He's through, been through a rocky road to pro schedule. He's inside row 15 with David L. Brown. Had a big hit at Richmond several weeks ago. Jason, he rounds out the top 30 on the grid. Row 16, you'll find Matt Danson and Joshua Balliot, the number six machine. Row number 17, Alex Murray and Justin Botello in the number 18 machine. And that is going to be your full truck rundown here for tonight. 100 laps, 150 miles around this 1.5 mile quad oval 
And it's going to be an interesting one here tonight as you see them pace around behind the iRacing pace car, getting ready to grid up behind it. Double file should be an interesting one here tonight. Three attempts if overtime, if necessary. Remember one year ago, like Dan Falkingham mentioned, we saw Anthony Burroughs go to victory lane on a late race restart, was able to defend Logan Helton, Max Brady, Kwame Scott, and Jonathan Delaney in the top five there rounding it out. And it should be an interesting one. As you see Patrick Gitter leading them down into turn number one. There's the young gun Jack Mace. Been doing great things so far here in the qualifying series this year. Always a strong driver. Has a great starting spot up there in that 07 machine. And the second row up on the top should be a good one here tonight. And the pace car is getting ready to duck down pit road here tonight at Texas. The virtual fans are up on their feet. Race number five of round one from Texas Motor Speedway is underway. We're racing in the Lone Star State. They go down to complete the line. Patrick Gitter's going to lead that first lap. Clean and green so far. One down, 99 to go as they make their way back to turn number one. Take a look at Carson Bowers. He had a rough race at Richmond. He's looking to bounce back. Look at him try to take that second spot. Yeah, doing a great job right there, obviously, being Patrick Gitter right up on that outside lane. He's going to come right down in front of Carson Bowers, entering turn number three here. Coming around to complete lap number two, you see all the way up at the top of the racetrack. That's the number five machine of Agnel Phillip. And, whoa, they're fanning out big time here. Kenneth nearly going into the grass right there as they head into turn one. A couple drivers peaking at the quad oval before they can get to turn one and four. Patrick Gitter to lead from pole here at Texas. This is going to mean a lot on track position. He had to dig through the trenches two weeks ago at Richmond Raceway. Got involved in several incidents, but here looking to turn things around. Although he did get that little scare from Bowers and Pettis. Remember, these trucks are basically full throttle almost the entire way around Texas Motor Speedway, specifically in three and four. There's so much momentum and draft you can carry from the exit of four to the entry of one. So keep that in mind as these guys move forward, but your top three have broken away. Gitter, Bowers, and Pettis leading them back to the back straightaway. And you see right there, Dylan Pettis moves out of line to go to the bottom here of Carson Bowers. He'll make it look easy, but Bowers does not want to try to attempt to hold him off, doesn't want to wear out the tires. And Dan, when you come to a track like Texas, yes, it's full throttle, but on these long runs, uh, you're going to see that right front tire obviously start to kind of fall off. So you want to make sure that you're saving at least a little bit of tire despite it being full throttle because on the long runs, it's really going to hurt you and it's going to be hard to navigate through this traffic already with how hard this track is to pass at. Yeah, sure. With how much on throttle time, like you mentioned, like these guys want to make sure they have really good handling when it comes on a long run as the tires do wear out because handling is going to matter. Make sure these guys are able to have really good turn through turns one and two, especially with, with them being off the throttle, and then make sure they're going to still be able to carry momentum through turns three and four with how much on throttle time that there still is. They're not going to be wide open completely, but still going to be a, a lot of, using a lot of throttle when going through turns three and four as we got to battle for the race lead. Battle for the race lead down into turn number three. It looks like Dylan Pettis is going to be able to take the race lead away from Patrick Gitter. Carson Bowders still sitting there in the third position here as they come around completing lap number six. Seven will go up on the board, and there it is. They fly into turn number one, and the leaders are now kind of starting to get separated. But, I mean, Kenneth, the one thing that I think saves a lot of these drivers that, that they're able to save a little bit more tire wear when you come to a track like this is obviously how big the draft is with how aerodynamically dependent these truck series machines are. Yeah, and it was similar to what we saw at Las Vegas not that long ago in round one. Just many drivers sticking to each other nose to tail just because the draft just carries you so much around the speedway and because you don't really have to lay out the throttle all that much. So there's not that much room 
for a lot of separation between the competition. So you're going to be looking at these guys packed in as a couple drivers strike the outside wall at the exit of turn two. I think that was Jack Mason, the 07, that got a piece of it just a tad bit. But you're right, the draft it really matters here. And it's all going to come down to how you swing that momentum to your favor. You look at these guys going side by side, our first battle inside the top five between Daniel Nanny and Agnel Phillip. I mean, they're going to lose a lot of the draft just because they're running side by side, but benefit to those on the bottom just because they can swing their way around with enough of that draft possible. And obviously the bottom of the racetrack is the place to go, but during the long runs, you could kind of start to see that outside lane work a little bit with how strong the draft is. You're right on board with fourth place driver Daniel Nanny right there. You see the rear tailgate right behind him. He's got Agnel Phillip, Ryan Andrew, Dalton Millam also in the number 15 machine. They hit the tri-oval, or should I say the quad-oval this time, obviously, through the dog leg into turn number one. Still some more side-by-side -side racing there, Dan, throughout the middle, the back half of this pack. It's like they can't, you know, get apart from each other right now. Yeah, as we're taking a look at it, Brandon Hawk here on our screen. Like we said, one at Richmond a couple weeks ago where he led every single lap from the pole. As you see tonight, it's been a little bit more of a challenge as he kind of started a little deeper in the field than he wanted, but he's already made it time. Start at 14, he's already up, has cracked the top 10. Great job, obviously, Brandon Hawk winning that race at Richmond. Like Dan mentioned, winning basically the, not winning, but leading the entire race from flag to flag on the pole, doing a great job. You see him working to the outside right now of that purple machine down on the bottom of the racetrack and they're heading into turn number three everybody's still double file oh the 38 machine or the 98 rather i believe that is gets a little tight it's the 38 machine on corner exit but they're all able to save it but everybody's still chasing down the leader dylan pettis right now who's got about a three truck length gap to second place kenneth and that might be the biggest gap that we've seen all night long other than when the top three sort of broke away. Here's Carson Bowers looking to the inside to break up this Team Conti 1-2. Nothing that Gitter could do to fully shut the door in three and four. So Bowers will make the effort for second. This is only going to allow Jason Dillon to pull away in the number 14. He likes to see them going side by side in his rearview mirror because it only means more time between him and everyone else. Seems to be interesting how far he's been able to pull himself away from everybody else just 13 laps in sort of expected that we'd see a lot more rubber band style of racing where everyone's just going to separate for a bit and then come immediately right back together it appears not the case for Pettis really strong truck early yeah Pettis definitely with that clean air has the advantage out front he's probably put another two to two and a half maybe even three truck lengths between the second and third place drivers of Bowers and Gitter as they continue to race side by side going down into turn number one Bowers on the bottom and obviously the 21 machine falls in line right behind them they're going to get single file now Dan and this is a chance where they're going to have the opportunity to run down Pettis in the 14 machine yeah they're going to try their best Carson Bowers clear of Patrick Gitter they're going to try maybe work together to go catch uh, that leader there of Dylan Pettis but like looking at this field right now in the middle of the pack we're seeing a lot of side by side racing which is something I actually was wondering if this was going to happen because well, like I said, I've talked about for many weeks, Oval Refresh. The first phase that came out on iRacing. And this is something that I'm actually very surprised and I'm actually glad to see it working. A lot of guys are making the outside lane in turns one and two work really well. They're able to carry the momentum, carry the speed around the outside. And they're even able to do like as we run, well, look at Brandon Hawkins. He's going to run the top of three and four and he's going to carry speed and he's making it work. Making a lot of momentum work around that outside lane trying to make a move here on Brandon Hawk. And here he goes. He's going to look to the outside lane here. Going to turns one and two. Now, stay with me here. He's going to try the top here in turns one and two. And uh, he's going to try to drive around the outside. But watch this on corner exit. He drives it on a Hawk's door, and it makes it stick. This is great racing to see right now. Yeah, definitely, you know, a little bit differently than what we saw last year. I mean, don't get me wrong. Last year, it was still the same exact racing product, side-by-side -side racing. But tonight, with obviously the oval refresh that Dan talked about, Kenneth, I mean, these guys are able to run. Uh, multiple grooves nearly making contact right there would be Brandon Hawk in the 16 machine nearly made contact with River Hayes as they went through the tri-oval but again this multi-groove racing definitely showing and the outside might have an advantage here tonight possibly 
Well, first of all, sort of double vision that we're seeing Brandon Hawk and Brandon Hawk in go side by side. We didn't see that often at Richmond, but looks like tonight we are. But you're right. This outside lane is really starting to push, and there are guys that have moved up through the field courtesy of that outside lane, and Hawk is no exception. He started this race back in 14th, and he's been able to weave his way through the top 10. He's falling back now, but he made some solid progress to begin this race. You could also count River Hayes in this equation. He started pretty deep in this field in 25th third and this Chevrolet Silverado is now cracking into the top 10 courtesy of that outside lane it's probably the setup that helps them utilize the top lane but one thing that also matters to Jason that I know Daniel can expand on clean air necessary with these trucks these guys are taking advantage of it yeah definitely for sure and Dan I mean talk about that you know like Kenneth mentioned is the clean air you know we, we just mentioned it right beforehand but the clean air, and I think that's why Dylan Pettis was able to get out as far ahead as he was, because not only were the guys behind him side by side, they kind of had some clean air because Dylan was out there. But I mean, once you get side by side, the trucks behind him in that dirty air, you just cannot make a lot of ground. Yeah, like I said, clean air. Clean air is always going to be your best friend no matter where you go. You got all, all the air going down on the front of your car. You got all the downforce in the world. And you have all the optimized grip that you want. So uh, for Dylan Pettis, He's feeling pretty good right now, uh, especially as we hit lap. We're going to complete lap 20 this next time by. And uh, here you see, like, River Hayes right there we were talking about earlier. He's trying to work that outside lane. But other than that, really, right now, everyone's single file trying to get in rhythm. We're kind of seeing the long run handling starting to take over for a lot of these guys, not able to stay in the throttle as much as everyone else wants to be. So right now we're starting to see, really, who's got the best handling on a long run, who's able to turn through the middle of the corner, and who's able to have the optimal grip going through these turns as well. As uh, we got a little side-by-side -side battle, which says that's Connor Yerochek. Looks like he's trying to make a move into the top five. Or, sorry, that he is already in the top five. He's going for fourth. Yeah, and he goes for fourth underneath the bottom of the 32 machine, 88 with the wrap job on it. That's Ryan Andrew, and right behind him, Jack Mace in the 07 machine, seven listed on the scoring monitor. So far having a solid run, but obviously a long, long way to go as we approach the first quarter of this race. Already down, Nero Shack nearly makes contact off the corner with Ryan Andrew. Mm. And Kenneth, these guys are battling hard here for this fourth and fifth position. Well, they understand too, Jason, that they are going to start to lose touch a little more with the pack ahead of them as they continue this run. We've seen a lot more separation, specifically from your top six on back. It's really starting to thin out between the field so if there's any opportunity that you have as a driver to gain that little bit of track position then go forward and Euroshack not coming off of the greatest race at Richmond the Las Vegas winner from earlier in round one this time powering through the outside to get around Ryan Andrew and then here comes the possible two for one Jack Mace also looking up high in one and two yeah, and you just saw the 88 machine right there, 32 on the monitor. That was Ryan Andrew. You can just see him. He is really tight and or loose on corner exit. He got a little tight coming off turn number four, almost got up into the door of Euroshack exiting turn four. That time he slid up the hill, and Jack Mace was able to get underneath him, and they battle now side by side for that what would be the fifth position here, Dan, as they come to the start-finish line. Yeah, Jack Mays, he's trying to rebound from Richmond. He didn't have the greatest race that he would have hoped for two weeks ago. Definitely took a hit in the points, and he is right around that cut line coming into tonight. So he definitely, for sure, needs a good run as well. And, oh, there might have been a contact with the wall there. I saw a little smoke right there. So we look at Agnel Phil right there riding in the seventh position. Started second. He's falling back just a little bit, but he's staying content right now in the top ten. We got some really good side-by-side -side action right throughout this field as uh, that's Adam Garza leading a pass on River Hayes. And now Brandon Hawkins, he's looking for a pass as well. Yeah, and you see the four machine go to the outside there. That's Nate Stewart, obviously, battling for 11th and 12th position with Brandon Hawk down on the bottom of the racetrack, nearly slides up into the wall. And, Dan, I just want to, I want to bring you back for one second here because you think about the cut line you mentioned, and obviously looking at the points coming into tonight, 65th through 76th. And remember, the top 70 make it in to round number two for the eNASCAR qualifying iRacing series here. They're only separated by 20 points. And I mean, if you're a driver that's probably outside the top 10, maybe even the top 15 here, I mean, and with it being so hard to pass as we're starting to see right now as we're 26 laps into the run, do you expect to see anybody possibly throw some sort of different strategy into the mix here to make sure that they can have a good night if they're buried in the points? 
Yeah, well, for unfortunately for a lot of these guys, there really isn't much of another strategy per se, just because with how close the fuel window is to halfway, pretty much everyone's going to be on this same strat, and with just how much the draft means, especially here around Texas with how much throttle time there is and how much, like, wide, kind of just how wide the racetrack is, you're going to really want to try to pit with a lot of people, and you're going to want to try to stay in that draft. So, really, a lot of people can't really do anything different unless we get a caution where that will really throw a wrench into the plan. So, right now, for a lot of these guys, if you're not running good right now, then, well, you better hope it gets better because it, it's not going to get better. You're not going to be able to outfox anybody in particular at this part of the race right now. Yeah, Dylan, Par uh, Dylan Pettis is obviously loving the lead that he's got right now. I mean, second place, Patrick Gitter has been able to close in. Uh, just a little bit on him, but not by much. And obviously still having the lead, he's pretty much led basically this entire race so far. Despite obviously some drivers duking it out up at the front, and really it was just the top three at the time. It was Pettis, uh, Bowers, and obviously Gitter, but Euroshack I believe has now moved up into that third position. Uh, but Kenneth, obviously these guys are now starting to get strung out. I mean, what do we expect to see the mentality of these drivers here coming up. Well, for really the front runners, and it might just also be for the mid pack, is just to focus on what's ahead, which is possible green flag pit stop scenarios. These drivers can go about 40 to 45 laps on fuel, maybe 50 if they can extend it that long. So we might just expect our first round of green flag pit stops to come away in just a couple of moments, which means these guys at the front probably are thinking about that now. If they're not really able to gain raw track position just based off of their setup and driving style, then they'll start to think about what can I do on pit road? How can I get this out of the way to at least ensure that I can just run in a good position and maybe gain some in the later portion of this race? If you're in the mid pack, my advice, get out of harm's way. Don't be side by side. Try to get out of the pack and at least look to survive another lap. As you know, there's side-by-side -side action between Agnel Phillip and Ryan Andrew with Adam Garza right behind. So that's my biggest piece of advice, Jason. If you're at the front, think about pit road. If you're in the mid-pack, try to get around the drivers that are near you. Yeah, and obviously, and Dan, Kenneth made a great point there about the green flag pit stops, you know, approaching and they're looming out in the distance. And I mean, with the lap time fall off, you look right now at seventh on the leaderboard, Adam Garza. He, his best lap was a 30.285. Last time around, he ran a 32 flat almost. That's a lot of fall off here in these first 30 laps. And if you're a driver like him, I mean, when do you think the best opportunity is to come down pit road and try to make up that time and maybe take the undercut and leapfrog some of these guys in front of you? Yeah, and like I mentioned earlier, like it's going to be really hard to do that unless we do get a caution just because the fuel window is so close where you pretty much need to pit right around the halfway point to have any chance. Or unless if you maybe save a little bit of fuel, you can maybe go further than everyone else and that you can maybe have that tire benefit later on in the run. But we'll just have to wait and see. But for right now, I want to discuss, like, if we can cut to, like, the tail end of the top ten here, we got a lot of side-by-side -side racing, but I want you to, to look at guys like Nate Stewart, Brandon Hawkins, and a lot of these guys. These guys are running legit the outside lane to try to find Try to find some grip. Like, this is something I honestly did not expect. We got some three wide action right around inside the top ten with uh, Daniel Danny and others. But, like, this is incredible to see. Just, like, seeing these guys use the outside lane to try to find grip. Like, this oval refresh for, especially at Texas, I did not expect to see or to work even. Like, watch this going into turns one and two. And look at all the guys in front of them. They're all using... Some guys oh are going God. like three or some guys are going like three, four lanes up. Like this is incredible. And, and you know what the funny thing is here? You know, it, it, I mean, it's it's just hilarious to me in like a really interesting way. And I mean, hilarious by that is because you would not see this uh, nowadays, even from when they repaved and reconfigured this track, Kenneth, back in 2017. Oh, Joel, 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 on the back, on the front straightaway. I think that Thor Malone getting spun around. He tried to make a pass, kind of pull a little bit of a slide job down to turns three and four, and it unfortunately did not work out as we are now have our first caution on lap number 34. Yeah, and we saw some of these guys really threading the needle there. Great job by Dan to call out that incident. Great job by those drivers to avoid the spinning Dalton Millam. They're coming through at a turn number four down the front straightaway. Here it is. Look at the replay here on FTN. Down into the corner. He's battling there with the 66 machine right behind him. I believe he's going to try to do the slide job. Just gets a little loose. 
gets a tap. They all make contact, and obviously there, Kenneth, they just went around. But, I mean, first caution of the night, obviously, and that's not what Dalton wanted to see at all. Definitely not. And after 14th that he ran at Richmond at the checkered flag, certainly wants a better race, but I think a slide job effort here in three and four. Remember, these were the drivers that Daniel pointed out were almost going three wide. Daniel Nanny, Malam, and then Jacob Potak on the inside of the racetrack as soon as Malam shifted up the racetrack then everybody else just sort of came into the picture potak and nanny were in there as well then all of a sudden you have that minimal contact that sends him around a great job though by everyone else to get around the mayhem an extra look at it here the slight tap and then up the racetrack goes nanny as he hits potak and then up into the 34 milam i don't think this is going to be enough damage to take them out of the race for good as everyone else did a nice job of avoiding that 34 truck but certainly a big hit and it should jason bring us our first break that allows the field to hit pit road nice is an understatement outstanding job by those guys is probably the word that you would probably use because that could have been a massive uh multi-truck pile up there coming off turn number four and here they go coming into the pits you see patrick gitter he's into the pit box right now your pole sitter they're all going to take four fresh Goodyear Eagles, some Sunoco racing fuel. And, and, Dan, this is the thing now, man. With this caution coming out here at lap 37, what do you expect that we're going to see here uh, for the remainder of this race as it looks like Patrick Gitter is going to beat him off pit road? Yeah, well, now, that's, now with the way this caution comes out, fuel will no longer really be a concern for these guys, but they are still going to have to stop one more time if this race goes green, which now – maybe open the envelope a little bit in terms of like when they want to pit because the fuel window was so close like you didn't have really that big of a window of when you could pit but now with this caution the window is wide open after any time after halfway you can pretty much pit whenever you want to maybe like see if you can get a tire advantage and make up some time but uh we still have a lot of this race still got over 60 laps left so it's still a lot and anything can happen uh, in the final 60 laps or so yeah, and with the great action that we're obviously seeing here tonight, if you take a look real quick at the bottom left of your screen, a little QR code for you there. And if you want to get all the latest iRacing and eNASCAR news, you can scan that QR code right now uh, to sign up for the eNASCAR newsletter to get all the latest updates and offers. And also, if you like that, you're, what the all the action that you're seeing here tonight from Texas, you can mm -hmm. also go uh, to iRacing.com right now and sign up, and you'll get a discount if you're a new member. So... What are you waiting for? Make sure you scan that QR code and also remember to go to iRacing.com today to check out the sim racing world and start your sim racing career here. You get the one to go signal this time. Patrick Gitter, the race leader, overtook Dylan Pettis in the pits there. As you see them wrapping around one and two, Jack Mace able to come back. I believe he was in sixth there, Dan, uh, during that green flag run, but now he finds himself third. If you're a driver that's going to be restarting behind the, this first row, what do you got to do to make sure that you can obtain that track position that you oh so desperately want? Yeah, like you said, Jack Mays sitting in third uh, right there. If you're able to go, if you're able to get the lead, go and take it. Like, get that clean air and just get out front and just lead. Because it's always, it's always a good feeling when you can get out front and lead, especially in the races like this that have so much importance with them. So definitely for Jack Mays and that Team Conti machine, if he can get up there along with his other teammates. Like I said, if we got a Team Conti 1, 2, 3, can't believe it took me that long to realize realize that's significance but uh but yeah well if you're jack mace you had a terrible race at richmond this is your chance to rebound go up there get that lead and go up and race for this win and we're about to come down here for the restart on lap number 39 it's going to be patrick getter dylan pettis on the front row with jack mace and connor euro shack there in row number two pace car dips down below onto the pit lane just like that, we're back under the green flag conditions. Great restart for Patrick Gitter. Nearly spun the tires, though. Comes up in front of Dylan Pettis, able to clear him. Euro Shack cuts down to the bottom now, jumps up from the top down to the bottom. Jack Mace, though, Dan, able to take away that second position as he tries to run down the leader of Gitter. He's going to take second. Connor Euro Shack's going to follow through and take third. And Carson Bowers, he's going to try to follow through and take fourth. Not a good restart for Dylan Pettis, who led... A lot of this race, the early stages, and right now he's kind of fighting for the light to just stay in the top five as they're coming through turn three and four. Euro Shack, oh, almost got to shut the door right there on Pettis, but he will shut the door on Bowers, coming back down to turn number one, and now he's going to make a move for second on Jack Mace. Down to the bottom of Mace, entering one and two, wrapping around, but we've seen how strong, Kenneth, that this outside lane has been here tonight. 
And with fresh Goodyear Eagles, you can imagine those guys are going to be ripping around the top as we're almost seeing three wide for a second there. Almost looked like heading into turn three. Well, it's a bit of a caveat here, Jason, because in the early stage of the run on fresh tires, that outside Caution. lane is Caution. a trap. Caution is out, though, on the racetrack. It appears we have trouble with somebody at the back of the field. Well, Everybody stopped. Again. And it was Milan. Well, You're right. Yeah, and there is obviously Malam heavy damage, it looks like, to the left side of that machine, already dealing some more from what it was. We're going to take a look here at the replay. Oh, it looks like, whoa, look at this, trying to get around in the back of the field and then just drives it into the corner. The 63 gets into the 95, flips the right rear of Milam and obviously goes into the wall. That's Matthew Boniface in the 95 rap machine, 23 on the monitor. And, I mean, Dan, it's just guys being aggressive. They're, they're frustrated, I can only imagine, trying to make sure that they can hold off for every position there. Yeah, that's Logan Helton just throwing a block there for it looks like it looks like it was a block for really like 31st or whatever, literally at the tail end of the pack. You can tell it was just the frustration coming out for a lot of these guys that are just not having a good start at this race, just running around in the back. And you see Dalton Malam after that caution. He's just trying to get himself back to the field, and unfortunately this, he's now been uh, – a part of another caution, unfortunately. Just there you go. Just gets hopped around, but yeah, yeah, definitely a much harder hit to the outside wall. Definitely is gonna have some damage to fix on this caution. Yeah, and Malam came into tonight obviously with only two top tens out of the four races we've run so far here in round number one. Currently, Sat coming into tonight. 41st out of the 70 trucks that will make round number two. So by the looks of it, Kenneth. Uh, it's not looking too good right now for Dalton Malam. He's going to need something if he wants to obviously try to make sure that he can savor some points here tonight. Yeah, you're right. It's really going to be tough for him to try and rebound here at Texas, specifically with what's happened. I think the best news for him is that we are not halfway yet. We're about eight laps shy, and I don't believe the damage is enough still to get him out of the race. The only problem is the aerodynamics will be affected, so he might be a little slower compared to the competition, specifically on the straightaways. But you'd rather have the bad luck hit you early than the bad luck hit you very late in the race when you really don't have that chance to get yourself sorted again, get out of harm's way, and at least attain a decent finish as there's Milan coming out of pit road just in time before the leaders come out of turn four with the pace car. But like I talked about, I mean, the first half of round one, you can have some mistakes, but second half of round one, you really have to get focused and make sure that you can clock down good position after good position or wins if you can. And for Milan, it doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, and obviously after tonight, there's only three races left here, Dan, remaining in round number one. You have three really difficult tracks. You have the Monster Mile at Dover in two weeks. Uh, you have Darlington, which is arguably probably one of the hardest tracks to drive in a stock car. Uh, and then we go to the mile and a half at Charlotte, another drafting track. I mean, how do you think those guys are going to have to prepare going into those races here after tonight? Yeah, you're going to pick three more different racetracks to go to to close out this first round. But, uh, yeah, that's definitely – those guys definitely going to be on a lot of people's minds, especially if you have another bad point site and especially for a lot of those guys that are around that dreaded top 70 cut line. So uh, definitely not going to be a lot of uh, – not going to be a lot of really easy – easy going especially going to the final three races here in that spot but uh, for a lot of these guys they can take advantage of if they're in a points hole right now they got this race right here that uh that they can try to run well in, especially for a guy like jack mace who i believe is right around that cut line like one of the last one one of the last guys in above the top 70 cut line so if he can have a great night here in texas it's going to make his life a whole lot easier five points is what separates jack mace from the cutoff line coming into tonight's event he sits 67th out of the 70 trucks that will make round number two. Ryan Hill is the current last driver coming into tonight who holds that final spot over Thomas Delcourt by just one single point. While we wrap up our second caution, we're back racing here in the mile and a half in Texas. Great restart for Patrick Gitter. Gets out to about a two-truck tr length lead as you saw Carson Bowers go from top to bottom to cover the 12 of Connor Euroshack as they exit turn number two. Yeah, Euroshack did not have a good restart there. He had a good initial launch, then I don't know if he missed a shift or something happened there, but uh, he's going to fall back to fourth as Carson Bowers. He's going to look for second place on the inside of Jack Mace. Card Euroshack, he's going to move up there in front of Agnel Phillips. Phillips says no, he's going to go downstairs, and he's going to push Dylan Pettis right on by to see if he can 
crack the top five for the first time in a while. As we see Carson Bowers, he's trying to clear. Oh, he kind of runs in the back there. Uh, Patrick Gitter there, that's going to check out the inside line. And here comes Jack Mace around the outside. He's going to look for the lead as we are maybe going to look three wide. Almost three wide for a second. Carson Bowers thought about it down the back straightaway, entering three. Now they're going to go three wide. Here comes Euroshack. He's going to stick it through the middle there. Put Jack Mace up on the outside, send him to the back like they're running a freight train right now there, Kenneth, as they head into turn one, battle for the race lead. Here comes Bowers to the bottom of Gitter. And most importantly for Euroshack, he had the bit of help from Ryan Andrews and Nate Stewart right behind. You could also have Brandon Hawkins and a bunch of others to the list. We are still momentarily three wide. Carson Bowers takes away the race lead for the first time at Texas, four laps shy of being halfway home, and Dylan Pettis, after a tough last restart, find his way to the inside, dials up his Chevrolet Silverado, and he runs right behind in second. Your top two break away. Now Pettis, looking to the inside, gets the door shut. These guys are slicing and dicing like they're Gordon Ramsay on Hell's Kitchen right now as they exit turn number two. You see Bowers trying to snake a little bit down the back straightaway, entering turn number three to break a little bit of that draft away from Dylan Pettis. Connor Euroshack holds that third spot. Then you have Patrick Gitter right in the fourth position. And you see Euroshack trying to run down the two race leaders. Still double wide, though, behind them, Dan, as they come into turn one. Still double wide, two by two by two by two for at least the next four or five rows. As Jack Mace, he's leading the outside lane, trying to get a push from Nate Stewart. As uh, Patrick Gitter, he's getting a push from Angle Phillip there on the inside lane. And they're going to still stay side by side as the top three are single file, trying to pull away from this group that are just racing the heck out of each other. As we look off the off the back here of uh, Jack Mace, as you see the that just big old pack just chasing him, just running him down, that just stacked up behind him as they're going to go back to the turn of one battle and his team Conti teammate there, a Patrick Gitter on the inside, and he's going to see if he can get the clear. He's going to have the runoff turn two here. He might get clear. With the racing you're seeing here tonight in the middle of this pack, is they're going to go three wide. Agnel Phillip will throw it down and on the bottom there of the 21 machine entering turn three off turn number four with the racing you're seeing tonight. You could probably say that they would be racing at Atlanta here as they head down into turn number one. Jack Mace nearly clears Nate Stewart entering the corner. He will do that. But Stewart trying to work back up on the outside and get the run off the corner, Kevin. And this is a race high top five for Nate Stewart building up. Look at the blocking down low. That was Ryan Andrew looking to shut off Adam Garza right behind. And they go three wide. It does not get any less sketchy. When you go through the top 15, each one of these guys searching for the valuable points at halfway. Look at Kevin Champagne, who ran decently at Richmond with a different tire strategy, and then a bunch of others looking to play the rebound. We're back again three wide with Agnel Phillip right in the middle, blink split. At our Agnel Phillip there in the middle. They're gonna go back two wide race and other drivers still scrambling for positions throughout the middle to back half of this field. You get up until about Jack Mace is when they start going signal file or signal file here. They hit the front straightaway. We're halfway through this event now. 50 laps down, only 50 more to go. They head back into one and two and the battle for the race lead possibly shaping up here, Dan, as they head off to. Yeah, from 50 to go, now we're down to 49 to go. It's Carson Bauer. He is looking out that rear view mirror like he's at Daytona or Talladega, trying to block the runs that are coming, trying to block whoever's behind him, trying to hang on to that race lead. But uh, Dylan Pettis, he's been struggling all night. He's led the most laps. He's all over the bumper, maybe trying to take the air off that rear spoiler to maybe loosen up Carson Bauer's a little bit as they're going down to turns one and two. Pettis wants the lead back. He is all over the rear deck lid of that NFR slash EPI slash JDR graphics. Uh, Toyota Tundra down off of turn number two, down the back straightaway, and he's oh, oh trouble! That is a big wreck behind her. That's a one truck, and it's been down to the inside lane. As that's a caution, and that is Alex Murray spun out of line. It all started. It looks like he clipped the outside wall, and then he just got spun out of line. And as caution number three is out on the night. And we're gonna take a look here at the replay in just a second. And Kenneth, you saw it all unfold coming off turn number two. You can't, <laughs> there, it comes to a certain point to where you, you're too rough and rowdy, and right there it looks like these guys just all got bundled up 
at the wrong place, wrong time coming off turn two. I think it all starts with that checkup ahead of Kevin Champagne, and right here is where Murray is going to rise up out of two, get oh. into the rear end of Justin Bolton, and then gets sent around, confirmed by Matt Danson in that Altus Esports Chevrolet Silverado. And while one team, Conti Silverado, was looking for the lead in Dylan Pettis, the other in Murray, and getting the worst end of the stick here. And I think it was just uh, maybe the truck getting a little too understeery, too much dirty air. It goes right up off the corner and gets right into Bolton. So it doesn't seem like Bolton had really any fault there, just running his own line. And Murray just blends right into the back end and didn't really know that he would not be clear by that part of the racetrack. Gets into Bolton. And that's enough to send this truck to spin. Yeah, and Dan here, talk talk about this for a second because a track like Texas Motor Speedway where dirty air is such a big key factor here tonight. And then coming off turn number two, ever since this track was reconfigured for the start of the 2017 NASCAR season, it just seems like more and more drivers over time just continuously get up into that wall. They think they're going to be good. I, I mean, what does it feel like when you're in this truck here uh, trying to go for positions? Dirty air plays a factor and you feel like you're going to be okay off the corner, but then all of a sudden you're just not. Yeah, turn two, just simply the banking just falls away way more than you expect just because of just how flatter turns one and two is, just a couple of degrees more than turns three and four. Like, that's something we really haven't even touched upon, like, just how different the both ends of the racetrack are. Just turns one and two, it's just a little bit flatter and a little bit wider. Same for turns three and four. It's way wider, but it's the same configuration as it was before the reconfig. So just when you're dealing with two different ends of the racetrack, it can maybe... Uh, mess with people a little bit, especially off turn two where that banging just gets away from you. Yeah, 20 degrees in one and two, and then 24 degrees, only four degrees more uh, through turns three and four. The straightaways, you'll have it banked at five degrees, but it looks like we're going to have a new race leader here. Uh, Dalton Millam right now at the front. Don't know if he's going to come down to the pits. I assume he will here in just a second, and then he will give up the race lead to Cave McClendley in the Ford machine, but it looks like Dalton Millam here uh, is staying out, Kenneth. Uh, interesting call for the driver. Uh, never mind. Here he comes down pit road. But, I mean, you know, even if so, I mean, we're going to have a new change of pace up here at the front. I mean, if you're Cave McClendley, that caution could be your biggest benefactor here for the remainder of this race, Kenneth. It could have until he made that second guess decision. And why is because McClendley came down pit road for fuel only. It was only a five second stop. Oh, hence no. why he was able to gain all that track position. Everybody else behind him and around him took four fresh Goodyear Eagles. So I think he realized that he probably made a mistake down pit road and said, maybe I should have some tires to at least keep myself alive with this crew. Now for Millam, because of the damage he picked up on the recent cautions, he pitted 14 laps ago. So he's on an alternative strategy from everyone else. He probably was able to top off, get a fresh set of Goodyear Eagles and now he's here with everyone else, like I talked about. Mistakes early and bad luck will affect you if it's late enough in the race, but fortunately he had it early enough to wear. This alternative strategy might be able to work with all of the draft pack action we've seen off of restarts. And Dan, real quick before we go green, I'm just going to be straight up, man. What do you expect here out of Dalton Milne despite the damage and obviously the strategy call for him? They're going to be slow in the way and just hope I don't get wrecked again because it's already been a messy race for him. But it's going to be interesting to see this strategy. Maybe he's going to have to hope for some more cautions because all these guys that just pitted, they're good to the end on gas unless we get multiple overtimes. So to the scheduled distance, these guys are good, but Dalton Malone, if I'm him, I need to hang on tight here on this restart. And he's going already because there's no restart box. He's already taken off in the box. Green flag is out. Wow, interesting call for Dalton Millam. That might save him a little bit of time for sure up here at the front. And remember, obviously, with the way that the qualifying iRacing series works is you are allowed to go anywhere from the time of when the pace car hits the pit road commitment line all the way to the start finish line. But look at this, Dan. It's not going to work out for the 15 sheet. He's all the way up at the top of the racetrack. And just like that, Carson Bowers goes back to the race lead for four. Carson Bowers retakes the race lead to complete left 57 of 100. Time's running out for a lot of you guys, but like we said, we're past the halfway point. Crunch time is now. And for Dalton Malam, yeah, he's already, he's already missing the bottom here. He's going way up the racetrack. He's already falling back like a rock in the water here as Carson Bowers. He's going to lead a five-truck breakaway right now. There's, uh, as I'm seeing, I believe, that is Daniel Nanny, who got caught up in the first caution with Dalton Malam. He's made some moves, and he's trying to get himself into the lead. We really haven't seen him up in the lead at all yet, so he's going to try to make his name known 
and uh, try to get some laps light here. Maybe see if we can get to the front of the field here as we got a side by side battle between Jack Mace and uh, Dylan Pettis, who Pettis has fallen back a little bit on that last caution flag. And Daniel Nanny trying his hardest despite that damage that he sustained earlier. It doesn't look like it's affecting the truck that much. He is on the same strategy as everybody else. And he's trying to catch the two drivers right in front of him. You see the 28 machine there of Dylan Pettis and also Jack Mace. They go side by side down Kenneth as they head back to turn one. You talked about Jack Mace being in the position he is. Well, Dylan Pettis is about 21 spots off of the top 70 as we've got a battle for the lead building up. Connor Euroshack in his Ford F-150 is going to power to the lead momentarily. Push on the outside from Nate Stewart to the back of Carson Bowers. We'll keep the JDR Graphics Toyota Tundra up ahead. We've got a side-by-side -side battle now two rows deep out of four. They say Ford built tough, and Connor Euroshack has definitely been tough here tonight. They head back into turn number one. He'll be side by side down into turns one and two with Carson Bowers on his outside. Then you have Nate Stewart battling Paul Pettis there in the number 14 machine. Jack Mace right behind, then Daniel Nanny, your top six. Still double wide, Dan, as they head back into three and four. Nate Stewart has a little bit of a wider arc going through the corner. Let's see what kind of move he can do down the front straight away. There's some great racing here at the front of the field. Like I said, that outside lane really holding its own, especially at a place like Texas, where I would feel like it's mainly just single, single groove. That bottom is the place to be, but Carson Bowers, he ain't giving up this lead easily. Early on in the race, he was fine with letting people go trying to just ride in line, just knock some laps off. But now, he wants to battle for this lead. He wants to battle for this win as they continue side by side. Connor Yeroshack trying to get that bottom as Carson Bauer has a little wiggle on the outside there. But he's going to hang tough as Nate Stewart. He's going to have to make a decision. He's going to stay on the outside lane to try to push Carson Bowers. But Connor Yeroshack, he's still holding his own on that inside lane. Yeah, doing a great job. And oh, Yeroshack's going to slide up almost into the door there of Bowers on corner exit. Had to lift out of the gas, and he'll give that lead easily to Bowers into turn number three. You see Nate Stewart, Jack Mace, still trying to rip the top side. They come off turn number four this time by 63 down. Only a handful of more to go as they hit lap 64. Contact between the second and third place driver of Euroshack and Stewart as they head back to one, Kenneth. You've got two different sides of the battle here in this top five. You've got Bowers and Nate Stewart who are both in the top 70 comfortably. The last thing they want to do is throw their race away with a crash or a bit of contact. For Euroshack, Jack Mace, and Dylan Pettis, it's all about maintaining their eligibility to make round two in the first place. So you've got a pretty stacked group of drivers that know their fate, know if they complete the next several races decently, they could have a shot at round two, while everyone else behind, mostly in the top five, are hungry for a spot in the top 70. As there's Jack Mace ripping the top, he might get the runoff of two to get Euroshack to wiggle and flinch. He does quite a bit, but they're gonna single file out, and at least the war that's ensued in the top five has sort of settled now. It's calmed. Yeah, it has definitely calmed down a little bit, but most of these drivers up here battling at the front of this field Still looking for the first win of the season. The only one who looks like he's trying to win the second one would be Daniel Nanny. Remember, won the season opener for split two at Daytona. And you see him battling, trying to defend Brandon Hawkins in the one machine down the back straight away here. They head into turn number three. Will Hawkins make a move? He'll stay right in line behind Dan or, uh, Nanny there, Dan, as they head back to three. Back to turn three and off of turn four. Uh, they're going to come down to the stripe as Nate Stewart, he's in second, Euroshack third, Jack Mace, Dylan Pettis rounds out the top five. And it's close quarters, the closest battle is for P6 between Daniel Nanny and Brandon Hawkin. As Hawkin, he's going to rip around the outside lane and he's going to make it stick as well. What a run around the outside for Brandon Hawkin in that next Z-Sport machine as Daniel Nanny and uh, Agnel Phillip come to blows a little bit. As Patrick Gitter, uh, he's been silent this, this uh, second half of the race. He's going to battle the inside, try to get a spot from Agnel Phillip. But Phillip, you look at that, he's going to get that top rolling around the outside of Daniel Nanny. Nanny's kind of trapped on the bottom, just trying to build his momentum up again as uh, he's going to have to try to maybe try to find himself a place in line as they're going to remain side by side. And like we mentioned, the oval refresh is outside lane as we get some as we get some laps in, as the tires wear, that outside lane really starts coming into its own, which is really great to see. It's going to really make for an exciting end of this race as this field comes through three and four. 
And uh, as they come out through turns three and four, we're about to start lap 69. Yeah, and here comes the 21 machine there of Patrick Getter. You saw right there on the graphic, his lowest was 11th, fell outside the top 10. Highest was first, which is where he started. Currently sits in the ninth position, trying to work his way back up through this top 10. You see Adam Garza nearly just lose it into turn number two, slides up the racetrack right to the front bumper of the blue and black machine there. That would be the 88 machine. I believe that is Ryan Andrew possibly uh, in that 88 machine as they come around three and four. They remain side by side. Still Carson Bowers up at the top. Oh, and they nearly pinched the 88 in the wall. And actually there, Kenneth, he did. Look at how close they're getting off of the quad oval. And we're seeing that a lot over the course of this race, specifically as we've breached into the second half, Jason. The aggression is turning up. And with the aggression uh, comes a lot more sketchy moves in the quad oval where you can easily find a driver in front of you, drift up the racetrack, and that is free real estate for a bulk of the field looking to gain position. We've seen that so much with Andrew Kotak, now Kevin Champagne, who has broken into the top 15 here. And then all those guys at the front who have been battling side by side for the lead. It's been a lot of fun to watch. 30 to go here at Texas. One driver who would absolutely love to get not only his second victory of the season, but climb up through the points would be Connor Euroshack, who currently sits 72 points below the cutoff line and he needs everything that he can get there in 114th position out of the 70 trucks that make it currently running second here dan do we think connor euroshack has what it takes he's been strong started there in 12 lowest he's been was right where he started so it's been nothing but an uphill climb for the driver the number 12 tonight well, I mean, Connor Yorkshire, he's already got a win on a mile and a half on his resume for this season in the e NASCAR qualifying iRacing series. As we're looking at Jack Mace, he wants to make his name known at the end of this thing. And he's going for third place, last spot on the podium, inside of Nate Stewart. But Stewart, he's going to rip that top side in three and four, and he's going to keep that number four machine in the top three there as we got side-by-side -side battle there in the back between Angel Phillip and Brandon Hawkins. Angel Phillip, he's been really quiet this race where he started up on the front row and really just fell back and really hasn't had a lot to say in this race. But he's trying to get back up here because that's what matters is where you finish. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish because that's when the points pay out. As look at him trying to rip the top behind Brandon Hawkins. Hawkins trying to rip the top as well. Trying to get some speed around this outside. Like I've noticed in three and four, you just carry so much speed. There's so much grip up there. And they're just trying to make it work. As we have more side-by-side -side racing down in terms of one and two between Nate Stewart and Jack Mace. They're really fighting hard and that's allowing the top two to get away. I still am just absolutely amazed, but obviously we've talked about the oval refresh here tonight with how these guys have been able to utilize that middle and especially the top group. You would not see that, Kenneth, like we talked about in the real life, but obviously since the oval refresh, these guys have been able to run a, a, you know, around just a little bit more. This is definitely, I, I would probably assume, a different race than what we saw last year. It definitely is, and for Texas, it went through a pretty big transformation after the oval refresh phase one update came out on the iRacing platform. There were a lot of mile and a half ovals that sure did change and allow different lines to be usable, but not to the extent that Texas Motor Speedway is now. You're seeing a lot of drivers go to the third, maybe fourth lane, almost ripping the wall in three and four to where we would never see that before. And look at that outside move by Dylan Pettis running through three and four up top, use the momentum to get on the inside of Nate Stewart. This is going to be the up for auction position battle in fourth place. But you're right, this is a very stark contrasted race from what we saw last year. It has become much more dynamic, a lot more fun to watch. And look at this, Connor Euroshack charging to the inside on Bowers for the lead, and he's got it. And he's got that, trying to chase down that second win of the season. And he would not want nothing more than to come home with a victory here in Fort Worth, Texas. They hit the line this time by lap 77 goes up on the board 24 laps to go three quarters down only one more to go and it's all Connor Euroshack trying to set his sights on the checkered flag and pick up a victory but Dan these guys know it is go time how desperate do you get if you want this track position and all the points matter here in the closing races of round number one well, you can see there with Ryan Andrew just go where everyone else is, and he was about nearly on the fence right there, just trying to find any sort of grip to try to find some momentum there as uh, 
We see Dane Manny there trying to run the outside on Ryan Andrew, but at Ryan Andrew, he's been exploring a lot these last few laps, trying to get that very top. We're going to see if he runs it again as we watch down into turn uh, three and four. Agnel Phillip, Brandon Hawk, and Patrick Gitter. And look at these guys. They This is the highest they've been running in turns three and four all night long. Pretty much right on the edge of the marbles because there have been marbles building up on that very top line. And it's a very bad thing when you get some marbles on your tires. So, like, these guys, it's actually really incredible seeing how high these guys get and trying to find all the grip they can. As Carl Euroshack, he's pulled out to a near 330 car length lead, three tenths of a second in front of Carson Bowers. And, like, these guys, these, I, I can't get over this, man. Like, these guys are, oh, watch Ooh. out. That is Dylan Pettis. He got sideways off of turn number two. And now we're three wide into turn three and four. As Agnel Phillips, that opens the door for him, opens the door for Patrick Gitter and Brandon Hawkins as well. As we got action all over the racetrack right outside the top five. Brandon Hawkins has all of a sudden shot out of a cannon like on a pirate ship down into turns one and two. He runs right behind Agnel Phillips there in the number five machine, closes in on the rear tailgate. The five is going to battle with the 21 there on the bottom as they head down the back straightaway. Great, great action we're seeing here in the closing stages at Texas. One of those drivers like Agnel Phillip who has spread out their wings and let him fly. Specifically Hawking, he's been able to slice and dice his way through this big pack, which is an impressive feat, especially when you caution. think about how long it took to get there. There are the caution lights and a pretty sizable accident in the back. River Hayes involved in this one. Oh no, and there's the number 30 machine. You see him slowly creeping past the start finish line. That truck definitely might have a little damage that's going to take to repair. And you see as we take a look here at the replay, down into turns three and four, Dan, and where does it all go wrong here? It all goes wrong when we try to see another slide job uh, from River Hayes, and Kale McClinney wasn't taking any of that as he goes around and turns three and four on the front straightaway. A couple more guys got caught up in that one, but uh, thankfully, don't think there's too much damage, but uh, River Hayes simply just trying to make a pass there. That was for the 23rd position. Not even close to the top 20 right there. And then just uh, Clayle McKinney wasn't, he wasn't taking any of that. And uh, he definitely made his presence known right there through turns three and four. And uh, River Hayes ends up around, a little bit of damage, and an all shot position gone with about 20 laps left. Yeah, very unfortunate for the driver, the number 81 machine. And now this is probably, I would guess, more than likely here. Uh, possibly going to open up the pit window here, Dan. I'm not too sure. I mean, do we think these guys are going to come down pit road, try to shake oh, yeah. something up? Oh, yeah, they're, they're coming, get four tires, because, like, the fall-off has been pretty big, like we mentioned, about a second, second and a half of fall-off. These guys are coming for probably their last time down pit road to get four tires. Uh, maybe take some fuel, because, I mean, they don't necessarily need any fuel for the rest of this race, but maybe take a little bit extra just to make sure you can make those three overtimes. As here they come, oh, Connor Yoshak, look at that gap. He's going to create a big gap coming to pit road. But we'll just have to wait and see what happens right here. We're going to probably see a lot of four tire pit stops and probably your lot, your final adjustments. Uh, whatever you need, you better get it on the truck now. Make some wedge adjustments, maybe make some air pressure. We'll see what happens. As Oh, I noticed a little bit of door damage there to Connor Yoshak. That's the first I've seen of that all night, but clearly it hasn't faced him at all. Hasn't faced him at all for sure. Chasing that second win of the season. One top five, one top ten up on the board for the number 12 machine. So far this season, everybody looks like they're taking four tires. Seeing some drivers, though, maybe it's pulling some strategy moves. But look at this. Hey, out of the pit. Oh, it's too close. I believe Bowers. Carson Bowers got him. He did there, Kenneth, as they came off pit road. What a fight off the lane between Bowers and Euroshack. That was by millimeters, I think. Just several inches between the two. Meanwhile, Wilbur Hayes is gonna stay out. It looks like he will come down pit road next time by, but that's a crucial change in position. We saw Euroshack beat Bowers on the long run. Well, now Bowers has the efficiency of utilizing the inside lane off the restart, which only means Euroshack is stuck up top if he doesn't launch in the right way. Great pit stop by Carson Bowers at 14 seconds flat, able to beat Euroshack at the line. That's absolutely crazy for sure, and that might be what wins Carson Bowers this race here. Take a look one more time. Battle off pit road. Clean, clean exit there, Dan. Coming off of the pit road line. Just a great execution yeah. from the 42 machine. You can't get much clearer than that. Can just drive right through the pit boxes. Really no pit box rule at all here. So, yeah, just drive straight out and have one of the first pit boxes and just had a good pit stop to boot. And is now going to get to control this restart for the final 15 laps. And 
As we saw Euroshack there, as the run went on, Euroshack looked pretty strong there, but Carson on that short run looked really good. So this might play right into Carson's favor here, as well as Jack Mace, who's going to be restarting there in P3. Definitely, definitely got a great ending to this race boiling up, as we're going to be restarting with 16 laps to go, but the chaos ain't over yet, because people are going to get desperate. They're going to make some egregious moves. Uh, we probably won't be seeing the end of the cautions just yet. Yeah, we're going to have to see here. We're going to restart with 16 laps to go. And if you like all the racing action that you've seen so far here tonight, you can obviously scan the QR code that will pop up right here on the bottom left of the monitor, reminding you that if you scan that QR code, you could sign up for all the latest iRacing and eNASCAR news. If you scan that QR code, obviously sign up for the newsletter. You'll get all the latest updates and offers. And also, remember to go to iRacing.com to get your iRacing career started. Sim racing, whatever you may want to call it. If you sign up now, you'll get a discount for being a new member. So what are you waiting for? Scan that QR code if you didn't get the chance to. And also check out iRacing.com to step into the sim racing world here. We're going to come down to 16 laps to go. This time by at the line, the 42 machine there, 31 up on the monitor. Carson Bowers, Connor Euroshack, Jack Mace, Patrick Gitter. First two rows, 16 to go in Texas. Who's going to sling the guns tonight? Green flag is back out, and the field scrambles there, Dan, as they head down. Yeah, they're slinging some guns in the back of the field. Everyone tried to time that from freaking 25th place, and they're all just running into the back of each other. Going through there, through turns one and two, we're three and four wide, and doing also all sorts of uh, stupid crap there. As Carson Bowers, he's going to take the lead here on the restart. Jack Mace, he's going to get second from Carson Bowers, or excuse me, from uh, Connor Yershak, excuse me. He's going to try to get second right there. And here comes Patrick Gitter. He's trying to get back to the front. He started P1. He's trying to end the race P1, as he's going to look for third on Yershak. Yershak stuck on that outside lane. The outside probably not going to fire off here immediately on this restart, but get some laps on the tires. It's going to come at right back in. As here comes Euroshack trying to fire the outside. Oh, he's going to go up the track. Plows up the racetrack there. That's going to allow Jack Mace to set sail clear in P2. And now he's going to switch back to the bottom. What a crossover move by the 12. Looked like he was going to hit the wall. Saved it. Had to jump out of the throttle. But with the run he got, even though he had to jump out of it, got the crossover maneuver down the back straightaway. Now he's side by side with Jack Mace and Kenneth. I mean, Carson Bowers is loving what he's seeing in the rear, but he's not home free yet. Well, when you've got fresh tires like everyone else in the field, you cannot act like you're safe by any means necessary. Look at Euroshack being able to slide up in front of Jack Mason. That crossover the last time by came straight out of a Kevin Durant isolation play. That was a nasty crossover entering turn three, and he got it to work like a Patrick Gitter, utilizing the inside to get to the bottom of Jack Mace. Although the problem is not much help on the inside lane. Only Agno Phillip there as patronage everyone else has been able to move up high. And that might be the key to victory, Jason. If you can, experiment with cleaner air on the higher lanes and be better on the long run. That's where you want to be to get to the front, especially if we run this all the way green. Yeah, you saw right there Carson Bowers ducked down to the middle line on the back straightaway to kind of take away that slipstream from Eurocheck. But it did not do a lot because he is right there half a truck length in from Carson Bowers. They head back to turn number one, lap number 89 up on the board. Just 12 laps remaining. The first three drivers clear. They battle for the fourth place position. That's Patrick Gitter battling with also Brandon Hawkins in the 99 there, Dan, as they head back to three. Battling with the 99, Brandon Hawkins right there. Patrick Gitter got really close there. And he's going to hold that fourth spot as here comes Ryan Andrew. This is really the first time we see him making a crack at the top five all night long. He started in P8, but really this first challenge at the top five as everyone heads back down to turn number one, Brandon Hawkins. He's been one of the guys that's been very taking a lot, taking advantage of a lot using that outside lane. And he's trying to make it work again. And here comes Agnel Phillip trying to follow in pursuit around Agnel Phillip with Daniel Nanny right in behind right there. As they get back to turns three and four, the top five are set in sail. They're clear. We had a side-by-side -side bout for P6 with Ryan Andrew. is trying to take and he's trying to cheat, but Agnel Phillips going to hang on that right rear. Yeah, and they're all battling side-by-side -side here from the mid to back half of this field. You see Nate Stewart working to the outside of Kevin Champagne. Now Daniel Nanny works with Kevin Champagne, and we haven't talked a lot about tonight there in the eighth spot. That machine slowly starting to creep its way up towards the front. There's Agnel Phillip. He jumps out of line, heads down to the bottom of the number 88 machine. 
of Ryan Andrew trying to take that away as they head through the corner. And it looks like Phillip will just almost clear the 88, Kenneth, as they head back for turn one. But it gets so hard to clear a driver outright, especially here at Texas. Later in the run, it should be much easier. But when you have draft playing such a huge role and momentum swinging every which way, it's really tough to make a pass. And then when you do, you have the opportunity at the driver behind making that crossover attempt. Ryan Andrew has to fall out of this for now. And Kevin Champagne moving to the inside. And a really good run by Champagne two weeks ago at Richmond where he finished inside the top 10 on a different tire strategy. We questioned whether his call could work. And it did. The Rainbow Race EPI machine back up to the front and charging on the inside of Andrew who pinches him down. Andrew pinches him down to the bottom and looked like Champagne nearly was going to lose it coming off the corner. It was going to be one of those typical suck them around type situations you would normally see in the real world here in Texas, but it was anything but that. They get single file. Now Champagne battles with Nanny, able to clear him off four. Nanny thought about the crossover move. It's not going to happen, but Dan, only a handful of laps to go. Lap 94 up on the board. If you're Connor Euroshack, what do you have to do against the driver who has pretty much been the dominant truck all night long? I just hope your long run pace just comes back to you. And uh, for Garth Bowers right now, he better hopes this thing runs green, does not hope that he that there is no yellow flag in sight. As uh, it looks like Garth Bowers, he is trying to run away with it as he does have a nice little gap over Euro Shack. But uh, everyone right now is running single file throughout the entire top 10. As I say that, here goes Kevin Champagne. He's going to fire it down the inside. Not maybe for one, maybe for two, as he's trying to look under Agnel Phillip. But he's trying to complete the pass here on Brian Andrew. They're going to race side by side down the back straightaway. This is for the seventh position as they race down to turn number three. Brian Andrew, he's been working that top lane all night. Going is almost right near the fence. As we, here we go, we got a battle here for P3, the last spot on the podium. As Jack Mace, he shuts the door on Patrick Gitter. And here goes Brandon Hawkins, another man who's been making the top work all night long. He's going to try to make a pass here. Working to the outside there of Patrick Gitter in the 21 machine coming off turn number two. Nearly gets squeezed in the wall on corner exit, but Gitter gives him plenty of room to recover. And while Mace tries to get away from them, you have right back behind them as well. Agno Phillip trying to chase them down going on in the back of the pack. More drivers side by side, Kenneth. Everybody fighting for every position here with just four laps to go. And this is Johnny Avila on the inside who was as low as 33rd in this race and started 17th. We haven't really seen much of Avila all race long and also didn't have the best time at Richmond several weeks ago. Going to get the best of Nate Stewart on the inside here as Kevin Champagne remains in that fight with Ryan Andrew and Agno Phillip. But all while this is happening... Carson Bowers is still ahead by four tenths of a second, Jason, which means the time is starting to run dry. Three to go at the stripe, and Euroshack only continues to fall off the pace lap after lap. Yeah, and Euroshack's going to need about, he's going to have eight more corners to pretty much go here. Uh, if he wants to try to have a run at him, he's going to need a caution more than likely. You see right back behind him, Jack Mace, Brandon Hawk, and I believe Patrick Gitter are the top five. They head back into three and four. Two laps to go, Dan. I mean, this 42 machine of Carson Bowers has been on rails all night long. Night long, and he is one lap away from the white flag. That's all he needs is to see is that white flag. For someone, he's been struggling in this road to pro ladder the last couple of years. He's been trying to make it to round two. He has not made it to round two in his road to pro career. And this year, he is trying to change that. And he is looking really good to make that happen. Came in, I believe, around 12th in points with a drop on our spreadsheet coming into the night. And this, this is the night. This is the result he needs for NFR and EPI. He has one lap from home. As Jason, he is taking the white flag. One lap to go at Texas white flag in race number five of round one Carson Bowers has been strong all night long there as he wraps around turns one and two with the JDR graphics Toyota Tundra TRD machine Connor Euroshack trying to get his second win of the night it's gonna be too little too late and tonight Carson Bowers three top tens one top five now gets to add a win to the column Carson Bowers wins race number five of round one tonight at Texas, and they crash behind them nearly coming to the line. What a finish. What a race there. Kenneth Carson Bowers gets the job done here tonight.
And you can make the case, Jason, that it all came from that pit stop win against Connor Euroshack. He lost the lead in the run in the lead up to the final caution, able to barely beat Euroshack by inches. And that was just clutch at the end, holding everyone off and becoming the fastest race truck over the run. Carson Bowers with a well-deserved win. And how about this, Jason? Over the first five races and second split of the eNASCAR Road to Pro Qualifying iRacing Series, we've had five different winners. Five different winners. Crazy. And we still have three more races to go, Dan. But, I mean, touch upon what Kenneth said there. As you see the 42 machine burn it down deservingly on the front straightaway in front of the No Limits Texas logo there. I mean, this 42 got this win through that execution on pit road didn't spin the tires out of the box straight shot down the pit lane and beat him by near inches coming off pit road yeah like i said that last pit stop is all he needed and that's just how important that played and like he looked strong all night but really just having that clean air and he he was driving away those last five six seven laps he really definitely had the pace but definitely having that clean air and having that big final pit stop definitely played a part in tonight's win. But uh, definitely for someone who's trying to make it to round two, like I mentioned, it's been a rough couple of years for him in the road to pro ladder. And this is his chance. And right now, with a race win and second split, that's a lot of points right there going your way. And especially with three coming with three races left. That is very, that is huge for him. Yeah, came into tonight 12th seated in the point standings on the spreadsheet and obviously picks up his first win of the qualifying series this year and he'll started third finished his first connor euro shack tried to get that second win not enough jack mace great run for the driver of the number seven machine tonight brandon hawkin patrick gitter your top five kevin champagne agnel philip johnny avila ryan andrew and dan nate stewart rounds out your top 10 for sure there, and then we see Cade McClenney. He was in it there in one of the final cautions. He managed to drive back up to 11th. Great drive for him. Uh, Justin Patello with a 12th place finish after starting 33rd. Great run for him. Dylan Pettis, 13th. Logan Helton finishes 14th. Joshua Ballyett finishes 15th. Travis Manning, Adam Garza, Matt Danton, Dominic Lukomsky, and Will Cooley is going to round out your top 20, Kenneth. Hamilton Akoboise in 21st at the checkered flag. David Brown with a 30th place start ends up 22nd by the time we end this race. Brandon Hawk not able to go two in a row after winning two weeks ago at Richmond. He docks it in 23rd at race end. Jacob Potak with a pretty good start ends beneath the top 20 in 24th. Rounding out your top 25 is Anthony Permota, then Johan Seminario in the number 21 is 26. Derek Heitman started 29th and remained around that territory for most of the race. He is 27th. River Hayes had a top 10 run brewing until he got involved in a caution. 28th is where he finishes. Dalton Milan, the same deal for him, just bad luck striking at poor times. And not enough to recover at the end. Jimmy Norman in the top 30. Then Alex Murray, Justin Bolton, Daniel Nanny in 33rd. And Matthew Boniface getting the most damage and being our only DNF under green tonight. 58 laps down. Heartbreaker for Daniel Nanny, obviously. And that 33rd spot was running up towards the front here earlier on. But obviously Carson Bauer is able to pick up tonight's win. We're going to take a quick break, see if we can gather up our top three podium finishers. We'll be right back in just a second. Racing isn't easy, but experiencing it is. iRacing puts you in the driver's seat with the industry's leading sim racing game. Drive on laser scan replicas of the greatest racing circuits from around the world. Go head to head against other drivers chosen by skill based matchmaking to ensure competitive racing at every level. Compete across all your favorite series. In officially licensed cars, engineered to deliver the most accurate driving experience possible. Join a race or host your own with players from across the globe. Race against the computer or in a league with friends. Feel the thrill behind the wheel. Visit iRacing.com.
Welcome back to the conclusion for race number five here of round number one for the eNASCAR qualifying iRacing series. We have gathered up our podium finishers and we'll head over to talk to third place tonight, Jack Mace uh, in the number seven machine. Jack, great run for you guys here tonight. Obviously, that 07 machine really, really racy all night long. Yeah, it was a very fun race all the way around. Obviously, we had a had a fantastic qualifying setup. We saw the Conti cars one, four, and five up front, and then we controlled it, or they controlled it early. I had to kind of claw through the field as I had to start on the outside lane, but definitely had a very, very good setup. So thanks to them for that. Thanks to Crow Sim Shots for their support as well. And yeah, it was just a very fun race all around. Very enjoyable compared to last week. Yeah, no doubt about it. Obviously, Richmond was definitely caution filled. We didn't see a lot of that here tonight. But man, tonight you came in 67th in the points, obviously. And with the run you had here tonight, man, what's the mentality game going into Dover, Darlington, and also Charlotte here in the upcoming weeks? Dover is definitely not my strongest racetrack. Uh, Darlington and Charlotte I'm looking forward to, though. I think I might be top split for the following next few races. So my focus is just to stay inside the top 70 and wait for the points reset in round two now because if i can just keep having good speed like this on a weekly basis then i should be hopefully smooth sailing around two now with the good points from tonight any final thoughts before we let you go here tonight and celebrate that awesome third place run there for that number 07 machine not really no just thank you all for uh broadcasting second split you'll do a great job with it all right, well, there's Jack Mace coming home third here tonight from No Limits, Texas. And now we'll pass it over to Kenneth Bueno, who's got second place runner-up Connor Euroshack in the number 12. Here with Connor Euroshack and Connor, a fantastic run after starting in 12th. You were able to move your way up through the top 10, then get into the top five, and then it just came down to running for the podium. Second place here at the end of Texas. First of all, I'd imagine the morale is much higher this time around than after Richmond two weeks ago, no? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, the Nexus Esports boys built an absolute rocket ship. And, um, you know, if not for that yellow with 20 to go, I mean, I have that I have that race one. Our long run pace was just crazy. But I knew when I lost the race off pit road, my adjustments weren't quite aggressive enough to be in dirty air. And I just plowed all the way to the finish. But, you know, I've had a couple rough weeks here after I one Vegas and it's just nice to get some solid points and show that we can have the pace to win one of these. And talk about the difference in mile and a half so far in round number one. You mentioned Las Vegas, the race where you picked up your first win in Road to Pro in for 2024. How different was Texas to drive? How much a dynamic was this track overall in comparison to some of the others that we've seen and how did you have to deal with that and sort of adjust as the race progressed? Well, this is this definitely takes a lot more talent. I mean, we're we're sliding around, track was hot. I mean, Vegas, you just basically held it wide open and went with the lane, but here you're managing your tires, you're hitting your marks, you're off throttle. So it, it, it's definitely fun to race, especially with the new dynamic track they added. You can get that second lane working a little better than it used to. So it, it's definitely fun to drive. You come into this race pretty far down the running order, 72 points shy of the top 70 mark to get into round two. With this second place finish, I'm sure there's a lot of momentum, but I know the job is definitely not finished. Dover Motor Speedway up next in two weeks, and then we have the final races uh, leading up to the end of round one. What's the mindset like for you and the Nessex Esports team as you guys try to get yourselves in the top 70? Um, I'm definitely looking forward to Dover, I know. The Nexus guys will build a good truck. I mean, I've used about four drops at this point, so I basically just need to run solid all the way to the end here, and I feel like with this points finish, I'll definitely be up around the top 70, so I feel good about our chances after tonight. Well, Connor, a great run here to get you on track. Second place from the virtual Texas Motor Speedway. Before we let you go, anybody in specific you want to thank for the great run? Um, just all my Nexus Esports teammates, man. They, they put in a lot of hard work, and it, it's nice to have it pay off. Well, Connor, congratulations on the second-place finish from Texas. It's great to talk to you again here in the Road to Plus split, split 2 coverage. I can say that correctly on FTN, but <laughs> congratulations, Connor. We'll see you in two weeks' time from the Monster Mile. Yeah, you guys have a good night. Thanks for doing this. That's Connor Euroshack for Nexus Esports rolling into second. And Daniel Falkingham, you're caught up with our race winner tonight from Texas, Carson Bowers.
I am indeed caught with Carson Bowers. Buddy, how about that? You, gotta, you won the race. How about it? Bro, dude, bro, so excited. I can't even speak, man. I can't believe it. But, uh, Carson, you with us? I don't think Carson's here. Man, man, man it's just too excited to celebrate, I guess. He's I mean, he's speak. speechless, but, uh. I think he's already on, celebrating. I don't even think he's going to give I, us I the think, interview. I don't think he is. Hang on. I, we'll, we'll, we'll try it a couple more times. Uh, let's try. Carson, you with us? Hang on. Let's try again. Carson, you got a copy? And we're gonna we're gonna keep trying here, Carson. You got a there copy. He there he is, Carson. You got a copy. Yeah, sorry, my my internet just crashed, so pretty convenient oh. there. But um, oh. so I had to join on my phone, so I apologize. But I'm here. Uh, we got you. I was gonna say, how about the win, man? You got you got the dub. Congratulations. I mean, it's just great for the you know NFR program. We had a really really good set. You know, I felt like we were off, kind of at the beginning, but um, just we had some cautions play our way uh, with fuel strategy and everything, and just um, it was really good, especially the adjustments that uh, Parker made to the set uh, for that end run there. I was glad we didn't get a caution. I was afraid of what was going to happen to us, but um, just the thing was a rocket ship at the end of the race there, so um, just can't thank everybody at NFR enough, and um, it was good to see that Blaze won top split too, so good for Norse Force today, but I mean, the set was just awesome, so I got to thank the guys for all that. I, I can only drive it, so uh, let's talk about probably the pivoting moment of the race, the final pit stop. You came in second, but you got the win off pit road, and that pretty much set sail. You pretty much had to set sail for the rest of the race. That pit stop was very pivotal, and it pretty much got you the win. I know. That was crazy. I was not expecting to get the lead there, but, um, you know, got lucky with just how fast um, we had a really good stop. You know, Connor executed on pit road perfectly. It was just it, it was honestly just luck for me to come out in front, so – um, but I think obviously yeah, that was a pivotal, pivotal point of the race. You know, our adjustments were really good in clean air. So to get the lead, control the restart um, was obviously really important for us. So um, I knew we had a good truck when we would get clean air. So I can't thank JD, Parker, all, everybody at NFR for what they did. The adjustments that Jarrett um, had for us were awesome. So we just kept getting faster. And let's uh, hope to carry this momentum into Darlington. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about like how important this win is to – for uh, you, I've seen you. You struggled to try to make it to round two the last couple seasons. That just the road to pro ladder has just not been not been your friend to say. But definitely with this win tonight, with all the points that you're going to be collecting leaving Texas today, it's got to be huge for making that push for round two. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I think we needed we're, we're we're sitting in a good spot. You know, we used our drop last week at Richmond, just couldn't figure it out. You know, we had some good saves, but we were just kind of on the back end last week. So a huge rebound for us, huge confident booster to be here. Obviously, yeah, you mentioned I've missed round two for the past two seasons. Um, so you know, third time's a charm. We're sitting, we were sitting twelfth in points coming in. So uh, obviously, going to get some good points tonight and hopefully lock in in uh, one of these coming races. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll let you go celebrate, but before we let you go, I know you've shouted out so many people already, but any other shout-outs you want to give out? Yeah, you know, I just want to shout-out, you know, JDR Graphics, JD, everything that they do, you know, Norse Force especially, just they're just awesome people, really work hard on the set uh, day in, day out, you know. They do a lot of the work behind the scenes, and I just, you know, get on here and drive it when I can. And, um, you know, EPI, you know, the guys over there are really good. Um you know, good to pack test with. And um, so they've obviously ran really well with us. And, you know, just Jarrett, Jarrett Lieber, everybody on that crew, Parker, um, Frisch, everybody that puts effort into the set. And obviously you guys with the broadcast, it's uh, really awesome to watch. Uh, good replays uh, after the race. So um, appreciate you guys as well. Good night for Carson Bowers. Good night for Blaze Carver, like he mentioned. NFR slash EPI taking the top two splits tonight so it's been a good night carson we'll let you go celebrate congratulations and uh best of luck at dover in two weeks thank you guys we'll see you that is carson bowers the winner tonight at texas and like we want to give a shout out to blaze Crawford winning top split in a photo finish a very close photo finish there for top split which is really awesome to see but uh yeah carson bowers here tonight second split what a win for him yeah, it was an insane win for the driver, obviously, the 42 machine. And and right there, Kenneth, you know, like we talked about, I mean, he probably would have not won this race has had it not been for that amazing 
Kyle Larson style execution on pit road there. You know, a lot of times we talk about Texas and, you know, talk about top split and how it went. Coming down to the wire just because everyone's so close and it mostly comes down to really close finishes, but it was all about strategy. It was all about knocking down that final pit stop. It was the money stop. We certainly expected more cautions to come out, but Bowers was prepared in the case that it didn't. He led the way through. He just pulled away from Euroshack off the adjustments on the pit stop, and oh, what a great job for Bowers all night long. He's been able to run fast throughout this race, and I'd say the best rebound since Richmond, where he was involved in so many incidents, and Daniel can also attest to that as well. We saw him struggle a bit, get into contact with other drivers. It just did not go his way. The way it turns around this time around at Texas Motor Speedway means it's going to mean a lot for Carson Bowers moving into the Monster Mile, one of the more tougher tracks we'll see in round one before we end it in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, and Dan, with that being said now, obviously three races remain, like we've talked about. You have Dover, Darlington, and Charlotte, three completely different racetracks uh, that some drivers are going to be good at. I mean, what do you expect heading into Dover in a couple of weeks? Yeah, like I said, three completely, three completely different racetracks. But Dover, I'm very interested to see how Dover is going to take place because like we saw tonight, uh, we did not expect to see the great racing we had tonight where we could see like two, three, even like the fourth lane at times, even right near the right near the fence. So many different lanes were working. I think we're going to see the same at Dover two weeks' time at the concrete because I've actually run a Dover race here and there where that oval refresh I really think has the greatest effect. So Dover is definitely going to be a track to watch to see if that oval refresh, that dynamic track, so if we can create some different lines of racing and hopefully put on another good show in two weeks' time, especially for a lot of these guys. That, uh, that maybe not had a good night tonight, they uh, they need to start figuring something out because time's running out for them to make this top 70. Yeah, for sure. And obviously, this is now wrapping up the fifth race of the season. Only three more to go. Dover Motor Speedway coming up in two weeks' time. And that's going to be it for tonight's broadcasting coverage here on FTN. For everybody at FTN, iRacing, eNASCAR, iRacing as well. I'm Jason Rockfell alongside Kenneth Bueno and Daniel Falkingham saying good night. We'll see you in two weeks' time from the Monster Mile.